Tengo el gusto, el gran honor de presentar a David Nicolás. Él es fundador de la empresa Cyber Research Limited en el Reino Unido. Él es fundador y director actualmente. Él es especialista en el comportamiento de los usuarios en, en, el medio, en el medio de Internet. Ha hecho muchos estudios de usuarios, sobre todo es muy conocido por los estudios sobre los uh, nuevos investigadores, los investigadores jóvenes, pero ha hecho muchos estudios sobre la reputación académica, um, uh, uso, utilización de, de revistas y, y libros por parte de los académicos. Fue director del, del Departamento de Estudios de Información de la City, uh, de la City University de Londres y también director del Departamento de Estudios de Información del University College of London también. Ha sido el investigador principal de más de 60 proyectos de investigación, con proyectos millonarios, de eh, grandes proyectos. Él ha sabido conjugar la colaboración de muchos expertos en toda Europa, por ejemplo, una colaboradora de sus proyectos eh, es Blanca, Blanca Rodríguez, y ha escrito más de 500 artículos de, de investigación y actualmente es profesor adjunto de la University of Tennessee en Estados Unidos. Le paso la palabra, David. Ok, ¿can you hear me? Yes. I'm told I've got to speak slowly. Uh, I'm told I've got to sit down, which is two things I don't do very frequently, so uh, you'll have to bear with me. Um, What I'm going to do is, because I'm, I'm conscious that you're not all, uh, or you probably haven't heard an English speaker for three years. This is the first time I've given a live lecture for three years. It's just amazing. In fact, our research is really about that, is what has happened to academe, to early career researchers, and to journals in those three years of devastation. And it's not over. <laughs> so I, I suppose we're reporting from the front line. And we're reporting from the front line for eight countries around the world, Russia, China, Spain, UK, United States, to see how all of these countries have fared in regard to COVID. But also, there our project's called Harbingers. And I don't know how that translates into To, to Spanish. It could even be a Spanish word, couldn't it? Harbingers of change, the winds of change, right? When I started long ago in higher education, there was very little change. Just a change of the head of department, an occasional change, but no fundamental changes. In the last three years, we've not only seen a new generation arrived, the millennials, who are quite different, as I notice with my children, I bet you with your children and your grandchildren. These people think differently. They're much more open and transparent, and they're much more open to sharing. I lived in a very competing environment, and here we have people who do things slightly differently. So this project I'm talking about now has been going with, with Spain and, and, and the other countries for six years. And I like to put it down like this. We've been having a conversation with the most vulnerable and youngest group of researchers and the researchers of tomorrow. And these researchers pose us with generational change Will they use libraries? Will they do journals? Will they do the same thing? And also, COVID. Now, what COVID has done is hit higher education around the world massively. In the UK, like here, they just closed down, like the churches. That was it, closed down. Now, what happens when a higher education system when young, vulnerable researchers, the first ones who are fired, are hit by that system. In the UK and the USA, we worried about the lost generation. 
that the, the, the future researchers would not make it because they were peeled off the system. Yeah? Now, we're still looking. What's the new normal? What is the new normal? We're told the new normal. Now, I noticed, I was reading on the plane coming into Madrid, The Economist magazine, I'd have a look at it, it's very, very good. They've got a new normal index in which they're showing by graph around the world whether some things are returning to normal and others are not, okay? Now, that's the background to this. Now, what I'm going to be talking today is about one element of that change, but if you want to see what we're reporting around the world, and Blanca too, then please go to our website. You'll see the PowerPoints for this, this project, plus all of the other work we've done. So, although there's a fair amount of detail here, I'm actually just going to browse through and pick out the main points so that then you can look at these PowerPoints in detail uh, with Google Translate and then work out, you know, what the depth is. And please, please do email me and Blanca if there's no way we can give you eight years of conversation com around the world in 25 minutes. But all I can do is point you to the interesting aspects of our research. And because it's not a survey, it's not a questionnaire, Blanca has been talking to 22, 25 early career researchers, junior researchers, for eight years. And we, we, don't, we don't say, do you do this, do you do that? We just ask them to talk about research, about working from home, you know, how they go about publishing and all of those kinds of things. And we have built an element to trust with them. Questionnaires don't work anymore. We get too many of them. You just tick, get the 50p, get the $50. It, they don't just are not as effective. But conversations still do. As I saw when I was going around the wet area of um, Leon last night, everybody was drinking, talking, eating. I mean, the whole town was doing it. This is the way to people's hearts, and clearly this is a powerful methodology. You know. So anyway, you know, that's the background, and what I'm going to do is just traipse through some of these slides and just point to you the kind of general points that we are coming up with. Right. Okay. So, whoops. I'll get rid of that. Okay, yeah. Okay, that's just a little bit of the background. I think I've given you a background. We're, we're funded by the AP, a, AP Sloan Foundation, United States, but there's a whole group of us working for this study. Um, I, I notice you don't use the word early career researchers. Uh, you tend to use the word junior researchers, but we're talking about untenured researchers. They're not always young anymore because they can't get jobs. But they are the first one on the rung into academe. And these are all people doing research, but not tenured. That would, they don't have a permanent job, right? Some of them are PhD students working on a research project. Others are research fellows and some things like that. So that these, are, these are the future. They are tomorrow's Nobel Prize winners. They are tomorrow's future. And the mistake to believe is that, in fact, these people are junior and immature. They're not. They are the research workhorses. They do everything. Searching, retrieving, publishing, even getting funding. These are very important people. Our main methodology is talking to them. We had to do it remotely because of COVID, just talking to them openly with a kind of broad schedule of questions about every aspect of their life, you know, their progression, reputation, scholarly communications behavior. Today I'm going to be talking about journal publishing, um, which is the most important element of their lives, because it is their passport to tenure 
to professorships and all the rest of it. So we're actually looking at the jewel in the crown today. We're just, we'll look at lots of other things, open access publishing, but here we're concentrating on this one measure that measures us all. How I got my promotion, as you got a promotion, is where you publish your papers. Yeah. So we ask them. Yeah. Now the interesting thing here is that COVID and millennials, the new generation, was actually going to be forces for change, right? The EU believed this, that in fact, they want to move away from the existing model where research is defined, research excellence is defined by publishing and publishing in the top journal, yeah? They don't like that. They think that is a one-dimensional way of measuring people, yeah? But every university, every funder insists that you published in these journals, right? So, would COVID shape this? See, because during COVID, there was this marvelous example of where people shared information quickly rapidly and fast. None of these six months wait, because it couldn't wait. Let's publish in preprints. Now, did this topple the existing system? Oh, make yourself an open access, don't they? Do fast peer review, yes. So all of these things, which a number of agencies like the European Union and some funders wanted, they actually wanted the fundamentals to change. Guess what? Hardly changed at all. Guess what? Because everybody knows where their bread is. Everybody knows how they're measured. <laughs> how you pay for your children's education. All the rest of it comes down to, do you publish in nature? Yeah? Now, you might say, as we might say, well, this is a bit one-dimensional. This is a very narrow way of defining talent. Well, you could say that same about football, you know. Scoring goals is, is the, the way you go up the table. But we know there are lots of other characteristics in it, yeah? So what we're looking at today, and when you get to look at the full thing, is what difference to the existing model, a model that hadn't been challenged for hundreds of years, or 100 years at least, would it change? I mean. There's no doubt that COVID is massive, was massive. If something like COVID hits and the building like that cathedral stays still, then you know you've got something actually goes its foundations deep into the ground, okay? Now, we're looking at different disciplines, social sciences, sciences. We didn't do the humanities because the uh, funder doesn't do the humanities. We looked at different countries. We looked men and women. We looked at young researchers and old researchers. We looked for every variable we could think of. And basically, they all behave the same. The biologist, the sociologist, the man, the woman, the young researcher, the old researcher, they all believe. Because there is one overarching system. Whatever our differences forces us to do it in this particular way. Yeah? We had two basic questions. How am I doing for time, all right? No, you're yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, when choosing a journal to submit, which factors rate most highly? Right? In other words, what is the definition of best journal? What's best in, in Spanish? Best, mejor. OK, that's it. <laughs> that. You think in terms of Spanish, it might be even different. How does it define? What does good mean? Okay, we all agree, yeah, best, yeah, good or best, goodest. But what is the definition of that? Huh? 
Well, as you see, there are 17 definitions almost. Ah, so which definition do people agree to? Right. So that was our big question. And the second one, is the pandemic likely to change things? Right. I've covered those two areas about we're looking at the two pronged challenges of generational change, the pandemic. Deciding on the right journals. Now, in our earlier studies, this is when at right at the beginning, 2016, pre-COVID, we saw slow changes in attitude, millennial changes, because we hadn't hit COVID then, slow changes in attitude. That the millennials were much more open to open access, open science, openness generally. They almost define themselves by openness, right? But attitudes had changed slowly, but practices never had. It moved, yeah? So yes, we are sympathetic, we like it, and you'll see some quotes in a minute, but we can't do it. Could be suicide for our careers. What's most important? And then along comes the pandemic. Electric shock treatment for our edifice. What remains after that earthquake? Okay. Well, there was some thought that we've talked about that actually rapid transmission would rate more highly now. You'd say, no, no, I'm not going to go for nature, it's going to take too long. No, I'm going to go for a lower journal because it would move things around more readily. So, and then there was this, the other aspect of COVID we hadn't talked about, this whole thing about outreach, which I, I believe is big in Spain, is don't just talk to your own community, talk to the wider community, general public, whatever else, and actually translate your research into, I mean, and COVID did this brilliantly, didn't it? You know, on the news, everybody was explaining to us what was actually happening, you know, what these viruses meant and all the rest of it. Brilliant example. So could this be taken and held on by other fields? Okay, so that was one of the kind of things. Trouble is, you don't get any marks for that. Oh, yeah, they like you doing it but they don't actually rate you yet by those marks. When we, in our first study, which we call Harbinger's One, which is pre-COVID, we didn't actually, in a sense, give them any sense to what might be thought to be. So we didn't put words in their mouth. We think best journal means High impact factor. We didn't say that. We just said, what do you think? Right, okay. And look, that came up with 17 characteristics, you know, so including no charges. <laughs> Don't charge us any APC charges. We can't afford it, so we can't do that. And then one that is dear to my heart, because when I grew up, hard copy was trusted more than digital. I even remember the exam questions about it. Yeah. You don't trust digital, can it be changed? Hard copy. And we used to insist that publishers gave us a hard copy of our thing because that was trusted. You know? That was passport. But who asks for that now? Hardly any. We, do we trust digital? We made the move, but nobody asked that. So that's not a characteristic of the, the journal to which you're going to submit. And I'm going to come back to indexation, higher IF, prestige, and high peer review. These are closer to our concepts of top best journal. I'm going to just skip this little bit here so I can show you <coughs> with Harbinger's two, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but just showing you, it gives you a nice window into the different countries, because don't forget, these, we're doing this over all of these countries. And this time, we gave them a list to which they could add. 
So, high impact factor, prestige, audience, standards of peer review. Now, these are largely ranked down. So, five is the highest, zero is nothing. So, five is yes. Yeah. Okay. So, high impact factor, prestige are right at the top of the list there, you see. Now, in Spain, I've little marked Spain there, you know, 4.7 out of 5. That is huge. So, that is what we rest. High impact factor journal, right? Second, prestige. Third, appropriateness. You can see open access, and always is, is right down the pecking order. You can see open access down there at 2.9 in the existing study and 3 in the most recent interviews we're doing now. Geola geographical location, no. Where index, well, we didn't push them on where index. And there's a confusion on where index, that is scopus um, and high impact factor. There are overlapping factors here, quite confusing things. This is, these are the common denominators. Prestige, particularly China, 4.8, Russia, 4.6, high impact factor, Spain, propness audience, UK and US. UK and US are very close bed followers. They're very, very related. Um, Malaysia, where index? Ah, right, in Malaysia, I don't know if it's here. You, they say you must publish five articles per year that are either in Scopus or web aside. Right? That is, that's a mandate. That isn't a choice. That is a mandate. You know, you, um, if you publish anywhere else, they don't even count towards your professorial career. Yeah? So it's not just high impact factor. It's where it's indexed. Yeah? And it's in Poland. I mean, Poland almost has a, a kind of Russian style, you know, communist thing, where every Every single paper, every single journal is graded. Yeah, everything comes with its little score. Okay, they do agree that web of science and scopus are the highest, but it's the ministerial's list of what is there. Okay? And I think, I mean, it's probably, I won't, stress on the last bullet point, but I think if, if you could take that one away with you, how best is reflected differently in terms of, you know, where index impact factor and so on. Um, some, some, but not many people say it's the quality of peer review. Impact. Impact of the pandemic on journal choice. Here we go. Not many thought it would change. I like that quote here, because don't forget, although I've been giving you some numbers, all of our work was qualitative in nature. I have no problem channeling my work in any criteria mentioned, but I think when it comes to publishing, then you follow your mind, you go target your submissions to where your university wants you to publish. Now, in Spain was the most adamant that there would be no change, okay? Now, Russians and Chinese are actually a little bit different. They actually think there will be some change as a result of COVID. Now, the question to you is, is why, it, why Spain is so certain there'll be no change as a result of this? Is it because you have a much more traditional system uh, or is there some other reasons as well? Possible changes down the line? There's a really nice quote I want to about um, speed. So, I mean, there, there, there are some supportive arguments there, um, Russian medical scientists saying why speed was important in medicine in terms of... Um, uh, um, and then there's a nice American scientist who said something slightly different below that, who, who actually would like to learn more quickly that, in fact, they were failed so they could go to their second choice. Otherwise, this whole stack was getting queued up. So there's another look at that. 
just if, if you could just dwell on these two um, about because the speed we like the idea of speed of, 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 of publication, don't we? I mean, a journal that will tell me, but then if it tells you too quickly, is it a predatory journal? How can they really do proper peer review in two weeks when they've got nobody on the editorial board that has any understanding of this topic? So it's a double-edged sword speed. It's not just a positive, it is also a negative. And that top one, the US life scientist in nature, he said he expects them to take a long time. You know, it's just de rigueur. It's just, you know, half of the course. Right. Now, the following ones are just about diversity, and I, I can skip this if we're running out of time, is that what I said at the beginning, that when we looked at men, we looked at women, when we looked at subjects, that basically speaking, there was very, very little change for the reasons I gave. We're all governed by the same factors. So, you would expect sociology, or would you? Sociology and physics to have very different ways, but no, they don't. Age-related, well, you might have said the young would be much, I mean, we're all young, but some of the really younger researchers would be more open to open access and so on. No, not at all. So little gender. Uh, ah, gender comes up much more from working from home, uh, problems of funding, and all of those other things. They're big, they're there. But when it comes to this, there's very little gender. Conclusions. Very few cracks in the scholarly edifice. Small little ones. The question is, do these small ones grow? Will they augur change? Or are they just simply small and will always be small? So, our conclusion is, the existing system of how we determine best journal and how important that we get into best journal has barely changed from the biggest challenge we've ever had in the last 200 years, well, at least, for academe. Greater efforts made during pandemic to make papers more openly available might be raising profile and benefits of open access publishing. You would think so. There's a lot of, there's sympathy and logic, but doesn't always translate into reality. There is a greater interested audience. But when you say to them, yeah, look, you've seen what happened with COVID. Why can't you spread your research in more journals, in more things? They say, nobody trained us how to do this. We've got no time to do this because we're writing in best journals and we don't get any brownie points. Brownie points, what's brownie points? <laughs> any points, yeah. Well, I did it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very interesting that you make a, a good picture of the situation, and in, in case of Spain, the, you uh, show the impactitis of the country. <laughs> yeah, it's clear in your study. Uh, ¿Hay alguna pregunta? Supongo que algunas. Some questions. No, I, well, you, uh, I would like to ask uh, if uh, you have seen some difference, I don't know in the study you um, saw this. I think in previous studies you uh, look at the, the ways uh, how um, uh, early researchers carry out uh, search in databases or to look for information. Have this uh, changed? Uh, yeah. I would like to know also what are the best, the, the first options for people to look for information. Yeah. yeah. That, that's uh, well done, Thomas. That, that was the best question. You got two brownie points. <laughs> okay. um, we hear, we, I mean, this is, we are seeing some earthquakes here, um, which could, uh, we're, we're, I mean, we were talking in a bar last night or whenever we were talking at lunchtime about this. There, there could be fundamental changes here. 
So far, when we ask people about searching and finding for information, they, they actually don't, don't even think of where they go, you know, because it's kind of like wallpaper. It's kind of, you know, it's just like a basic utility. So sometimes they don't even know that the journals that they're searching at home are actually provided by the library, yeah? They just, it's just here. It's a, it's a utility. You switch it on, it's like lights. We, we do that. So it's difficult asking these kinds of questions, right? But we thought, what happens when the libraries physically close down, which is a COVID thing? Yeah? And they did. They closed down, they reduced their services, they went remote, and some of them didn't even have good remote platforms, right? So we thought, hang on, here's a danger. The library could just disappear into the ether because there's no substance to it. You don't even know, you, were, you didn't know you were, early career researchers do not go into libraries physically, yeah? Full time, they don't. They, they, but they use them although they don't know they're using them, they're using the journals, right? The early career researchers are the researchers that do all the searching, right? As you would expect. Right? Professors delegate that, that role to them. So they know what they're talking about. Okay, so that's been true. And recently we've been seeing a kind of opening up, even in the digital void, between library services and other services. We're going to have a paper coming out soon called The Shadow Library. Do you know Sci-Hub? Do you know Sci-Hub, the pirate platform which steals all the, the data from all the publishers' platforms? Do, you know, do they, yeah, know? Yeah. Yeah, they know? Yeah, they know. Sci-Hub use has gone through the roof. Yeah. Nobody thinks it's a bad thing. In fact, and I love the French, the French even think it's a moral duty, they're revolutionary, of course, um, to actually do something that would disabuse the publishers. But of course, what they're searching is stuff nicked from the publishers, stolen from the publishers. So it's a bit of a naive, I'm not saying they're, you know, but they like the concept. So they would rather use Sci-Hub, yes, um, than not. So you've got people that, could use the library are choosing on philosophical millennial grounds not to choose it. Now I find that difficult to think about because you know that, that's not my line. And sorry, and the second bit about it is so they've moved to Sci-Hub. At one time everybody, you know, thought, well, yeah, but it's a hell of a, a fuss searching through it, and it's much easier to go to the library. Everybody knows what a DOI is now. If you've got a DOI, it takes about three seconds to find what you want, yeah? That's faster, I'm sure, than some of those library platforms. So it is fast if you know, if you've got the DOI. And everything seems to have a DOI. So certainly there's been a shift here. Now this is, this is, this is going on as we speak. Also, ResearchGate has come in and is beginning to soak up some of the searching. Because if you remember that it's a reputational searching uploading platform, it's encyclopedic, it offers those things. So we ha now have two platforms, uh, um, Sci-Hub and ResearchGate, which are s seeming to drag away from the library platforms. Now, you could say, you know, that's a result of COVID, working from home. But in a sense, they never went in the library anyway. We're only halfway through our study. We'll know more then. But there certainly is a bigger earthquake here than in, than in what we were talking about before. OK. OK. Thank you. Alguna pregunta? Pues lo, lo dejamos aquí. Pues nada, muchas gracias, David. Okay, thank you very much.